In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, born this night. Amen. Amen. Again, welcome and Merry Christmas. Christmas carries a lot of messages. And each one of us has an amalgam of those messages inside each of us. Mine is a hopeless mishmash of 1940s music and 1950s movies, Arabic pastries, presents under the tree, the Charlie Brown Christmas, which first came out when I was a kid, some members of the elder generation drinking too much, others causing grief, and through it my mother bending over backwards to create a perfect Christmas for everyone. We are all products of every Christmas we have ever lived, for good or for ill. There were so many Christmas songs in movies. My mother had a huge collection of records, not just LPs, but she had albums of 78 records. And uh, I used to love to play them. When you opened an album in those days of the 78 records, there were like six different discs in there, and there was a different song on each side. I'd switch the turntable back to 78, the speed you never see anymore, even if you do see a record player, and then play them back to back. Christmas carols by my mother's favorite singer, Harry Como. <laughs> there are a number of other things that I followed as a ritual. The jingle bells went on the front door and family greeting cards went on the back. Other cards were strung between the doorways from our uh, dining room into our kitchen. There were special ornaments that always were hung on the tree. And I was the light bulb watcher. If a bulb went out, I replaced it, preferably with the same color it had been before. And I watched out the window as our neighbor put up his Christmas display. There were Santas and snowmen, Joseph and Mary. To this day, I silently award a Stephen J. McMahon Memorial Award for the gaudiest Christmas display I've seen in any part of anybody's house. In recent years, I noticed that most of them seem to be uh, on the Lindbells Parkway in Saugus. <laughs> <laughs> the week before was baking day. The house was filled with the smell of butter. My mother made Arabic pastries, and most of them required lots of butter. It was baklava, of course, and uh, butter cookies called harini. She also made a fruit cake. Each of those memories comes flooding back as Advent grows long in the tooth. We start hearing Christmas songs too early. You hear the right song, and bang, there I am, right back there again. A whirlwind of people cascading through my memory. Once I became a father, I was able to see the patterns begin to play out all over again. In our children, we can see the magic of Christmas, the excitement, the promise, the ingraining of rituals never to be forgotten. And yet it's also a time that can affect us personally. If we don't show it, maybe it's inside us, but often there's grief or longing. It might be a time when we uh, think of people that were part of our Christmases in the past and are no longer with us. The older we get, the more likely we are to have Christmas memories like that. We think of Christmas settings that will never be repeated. Last Sunday morning at 8 and 10, we celebrated the fourth Sunday of Advent, and tonight Christmas is upon us. The Feast of the Incarnation is here, whether we're ready for it or not. And often if we are ready, we're also exhausted from the getting ready. Tonight we come to church having exchanged the Advent carols on Sunday for the Christmas carols of this evening. We join family and friends here, and soon we'll gather around dining room tables and living rooms to eat, drink, and be merry. It is a time of high expectations, where we hope, consciously or not, to make this Christmas as memorable as one's past, or better if the past ones weren't so great. It can be debilitating unless we remember one thing. It's not all about me. And 
it's all, all about you or you or you or you or any of us. Christmas is about God coming into the world for all humankind, collectively, as well as individually. Our own little worlds are wrapped up in, much, in a much bigger one, and that much bigger world belongs to God. Many of us have subsumed that message that God sends us in Christ's birth into our own narrative. It's often one that has little to do with the birth of Jesus. I myself, with a vivid imagination for a time that happened just before I was born, connect my favorite Christmas songs and my favorite movies with the time in which they were made, the World War II and post-World War II era. It's a nostalgia trip for me because even though I wasn't born yet, my parents were young and my grandparents were alive and all the assorted great aunts and great uncles that I remember so well. But what does that have to do with the birth of Christ? Not much, but still it swirls around in my memory. We all have to deal with our own stories, but let's not lose sight of the significance of this holy day. Once in the time of Augustus Caesar, in what we now call the first century, God became human. God did not show up all ready to go, nor did God select a palace in which to be born. God was not in some seat of power. God was not coming to earth as the high priest in the temple. God came as a human baby, born of a poor young woman in a quiet backwater of the biggest empire in the world. This Jesus was born into the peasant class of a subjugated minority in that empire. And everything he did demonstrated preferential treatment for the outcast, the poor, the marginalized in every way. Everyone despised by the Romans and the powers that be were who he came for. So he came as one of them. That God had come among us not as an angel or in a burning bush or on a mountaintop, but as a human being born of an infant to a powerless young girl and her working class fiance, who, while subject to the whims of an empire, were forced to travel while she was in her ninth month of pregnancy. By entering the world in a human form, for a woman in childbirth among um, poor subjects of a powerful empire, God was altering not so much the human condition to suit a divine being, but God experiencing firsthand what the human condition is, as it is, for those at the bottom of the pecking order. This Christ would have firsthand experience of joy and grief, pain and comfort, sorrow and laughter. He would be cold, hot, hungry, full, worried, at ease. He would be free to pursue his mission, and yet always subject to the arbitrary oppression of a great state. He would see life and death in all its unexpected and expected forms. The world he lived in was chaotic and dangerous. Death was an everyday occurrence. It was not hidden away in the city's seedier parts of town or in emergency rooms, or in nursing homes or hospices. It was right out there where you could see it. In those days, you could be robbed by petty thieves who didn't care how poor you were, or by the Roman Empire, which also didn't care how poor you were. An innocent man could be executed. Disaster in the form of drought, or volcanic eruptions, or floods to destroy whole cities and regions. The whole population of a city might be killed to teach the larger populace a lesson. If we didn't know it was the first century, we could easily think it was the 20th or the 21st. Today, in the United States, there are families struggling with no place to live, no food, and no table to put it on. Worse, there are families divided some by the arbitrary power of the state, just as in Roman times. In Christ, God has seen it all. The sad part is that 20 centuries later, all those things still happen. But Christ, having seen it all, is good news for a time like ours. A horrible 
things that humans can do to each other are not news to God. I take comfort in knowing that. When I break free from nostalgia and behold what Christ has done for all of us, I dare to hope. And in this day and age when we suffer from people with no vision and no morality in high positions in, our, in many countries, including our own, when we see tribalism and racism and sexism all on the upswing, hope is something that we have to cling to. And I do. What we know now is that God, through this human Jesus, taught us that God is always near us. And that we are the ones who have been chosen to carry God's message in the world. To carry on God's work in the world. There have always been dark periods in history. Some would say most of them have been dark. And the people of God have always persevered in doing God's work. To care for those despised and forgotten. Forgotten by the callous politicians and even the callous religious people in every age. I have hope this Christmas. Hope that people of goodwill in every faith community can meet the challenges that we face. I hope we can rise above the petty divisions that divide us. I hope we can defeat those responsible for dividing us. I have hope that if God could make such a difference as a human being, then those who profess God can do the same. So let us celebrate the birth of Jesus two millennia ago, and let us carry on the work we've been given to do to bring about the kingdom of God as co-creators with God. Christmas is about hope. Christ is the light of the darkness, and the darkness cannot 